our Father in heaven, we come before thee this Sabbath at this session. We do worship you and praise your name. And thank you for this day that you have given to remind us you are our creator, our redeemer, and that you have set apart this day so that it may be a sign that you are the Lord our God and that you are the Lord who sanctifies us. Thank you, Lord, for your mercy and grace in forgiving all our iniquities, healing all our diseases, and giving us this blessed hope. Thank you for this special light that is shining. Help us by your grace to hear and to do. Pray, Father, that your Holy Spirit will continue to teach us and guide us and help us to live and witness for you. Pray for Brother Jeff as he continued to present this message. Bless each, each one here and the families represented. Commit ourselves anew to your care. Pray for your continued watch care and protection and blessing on this blessed day. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In the prophecy school, uh, the format that I have in my mind, there was a, there was a purpose to what we shared. And, and we stated the purpose from the beginning. We started with some basic principles and rules of Bible prophecy. Then we went into the purification of God's church to lay down the outline of end time events. Then we looked at the message in Daniel 11. And then we began to um, try to con add confirmation to that message um, from the parable of Adventism and then from passages in Revelation 13 that sustain and uphold the same sequence, the same story as, Reve as Daniel 11. And we went to Revelation 17, attempted to do the same. Along the way, we picked up the role of modern Babylon and Bible prophecy so we could be familiar with recognizing modern Babylon as illustrated throughout the Bible and then bring those different illustrations down to the end of the world to help us see where modern Babylon fits in end time Bible prophecy. That was the purpose. And we all the time we're moving along to uh, the conclusion which uh, contributes to all of it which is the role of Islam in Bible prophecy. And uh, here we are now to where this part here is a, a tricky, a tricky pa passage to share, um, particularly when we're on the last full day of the prophecy school, and it, it's Sabbath, and we have a few things popping up around right now on different subjects that are that are keeping things interesting, and uh, which I'm not personally too threatened by. I think that's part of the dynamics of a school, if we're going to identify it as a school. Uh, none of us have a grasp of the truth fully, and we should be prepared to sharpen our swords with one another in a loving way so that we can all come into the unity of the message, so that I'm not too threatened by that. But um, it's unfortunate that uh, I'm feeling a little bit... Uh, I'm distracted about explaining this because this is a difficult one to explain. We did this in Columbia and uh, we led the whole prophecy school to this particular presentation, the next couple that are coming up. And uh, because it was busy at the prophecy school, the brother that was translating down there, I never had time to explain this to him before he translated it, which he likes to know what he's going to translate before. He doesn't want to be standing up in front and have someone start teaching error and uh, find himself in that peculiar situation, but, but we've worked together for years, so it was busy there, and, and he never got to even hear about it before we went through it, and we went through it, and when we went through it, he seen it, and he was just excited, and about that time, uh, another well-known pastor evangelist from the United States showed up that very day, and we were, he got there that evening, and we were eating together in the evening, and the translator says to me, to this well-known evangelist, he says, Jeff, 
tell him about the prophetic mirror. And I said, no, I don't want to tell him the conclusion of a week's worth of study right here while we're eating dinner. He's going to think I'm a heretic. But he wouldn't let, he wouldn't let up. He forced me to explain it. And this well-known speaker evangelist started going, man, that sounds a little bit heretical. But we worked through it. And before the weekend was over, the well-known evangelist invited me to come to his church and present this. And uh, this is not an easy one to see, it's particularly with but, you know, maybe some of the things that are going on around here that are a little bit distracting for all of us. So I would ask for your patience as we walk through this and for you to put your thinking caps on, even though I realize after a week our brains are full of information. But this is called the prophetic mirror. It's still, we still have a few platforms to put in place before we get here. But we have already covered the characteristics of the first woe. Um, these are a little bit more summarized down than when I went through them last night, I believe. Uh, the first woe, Arabic Islam. I'm calling it Arabic Islam to make a distinction between um, Arabic Islam and Turkey Islam. That is not the... the the words that the pioneers used, but I'm bringing modern ter terminology to keep it more simple for us. Uh, this is the Islam that began in Arabia. It's a power from the bottomless pit. The bottomless pit powers, um, I don't know if you've thought about it. Usually if you ask Seventh-day Adventists, uh, what's the false trinity in the book of Revelation? What's the false trinity in the book of Revelation? Dragon, beast, and false prophet. And that's certainly true, but what's the secondary false beef, be false trinity in the book of Revelation? Because there is a secondary false trinity in the book of Revelation. And it's that there are three powers in the book of Revelation that come up out of the bottomless pit. Modern Rome comes out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 17, and it is the beast. Atheism comes out of the bottomless pit in Revelation 11, and it's the dragon power. Without a doubt, it's the dragon power. And Islam comes out of the bottomless pit right here in Revelation 9, and it is the false prophet. So uh, sometimes we don't realize that, that the Lord employs certain symbols such as attaching these powers with the bottomless pit because he wants us to understand that there's a whole lot of history, a whole lot of dynamics going on, and we need to identify, uh, make distinctions between these different players, but understand that the Lord puts these tags on them to identify their role. And the powers from the bottomless pit, they have a specific um, role to play at the very end of the world. <coughs> Atheism will be there to the very end. Islam will be there to the very end. And of course, modern papacy will be there to the very end. But dealing with the first woe, Arabic Islam, a power from the bottomless pit. It was sudden and violent in nature. Uh, what brought it into history, the key that opened the way for Islam to rise, was a prolonged war between east and west, culminating with the Battle of Nineveh. I guess that's E-H at the end, if you're taking notes, rather than A-H. Nineveh is A-H. And it preceded their rise to power, and they were to torment and hurt the beast that was. Eastern pagan Rome was the beast that was at that time because they were raised up as a scourge against the papacy. The papacy was in history at that time. Therefore, at that point in history, the papacy was the beast that is, and pagan Rome was the beast that was. So they were raised up to torment and hurt the beast that was and the beast that is. They were not to hurt those who had the seal of God. They were to hurt and torment for five months. You see the dates there. Uh, they began, the Ottoman Empire begins here, which ultimately is going to be what we call Turkish Islam in the second woe. They have a king over them who is the angel of the bottomless pit, a destroyer, both in Hebrew and Greek. And the dynamic that we have been talking about somewhat as we move forward is that the first woe, woe concludes when the last emperor of Eastern Rome, John Pelagios, left his throne to his son Constantine. But Constantine refused to accept the throne without permission of the Turkish power, then ascended the throne in 1449. In May 1453, Constantinople falls. We dealt with this a little bit. Let me re remind us of it, if you will allow me to. That the, f the first four trumpets are set apart by scripture. They are four trumpets. 
The last three trumpets are trumpets, but they are also woes. So scripture makes a distinction between the first four trumpets and the last three woes in several ways. But the history of the first four trumpets concludes with the identical dynamics of an emperor or a king giving his kingdom away, and shortly thereafter, his kingdom being um, swept away. And that would be Justinian giving the authority of pagan Rome into the hands of the papacy in 533, and then 538, the papacy becomes the fifth kingdom of Bible prophecy, thus making pagan Rome the, the power that was Papal Rome, the power that is. That dynamic, a king giving his kingdom away and then being swept away shortly thereafter is the same dynamic that the first woe ends upon. And this, of course, is, a, is where the second woe starts. Uh, and we see that dynamic again in the story of the Ottoman Empire that turn uh, themselves over to the control or authority of the Europeans. And we mentioned that uh, certainly their kingdom did not get swept away right away, but that giving over their kingdom was in 1840, just before the judgment begins, and that the stretching out of historical time since 1844 can only be recognized as being brought about through the disobedience of God's people. So there are prophecies that need to be related to in that way. But in the World War I time period, the Ottoman kingdom was swept away. Had God's people not been disobedient, it may have been much sooner than that. Second woe, Turkish Islam. Once again, same power from the bottomless pit. Sudden and violent in nature, but here we have an emphasis on the use of gunpowder also. And they weren't to torment or hurt the beast that was, they were to kill it or slay it, Eastern pagan Rome. And during this time period, the beast that is, Papal Rome, was also slain uh, by a a power from the bottomless pit, atheism, a different power. And it begins where the first woe ends, and it goes for 391 years and 15 days, coming to August 11th, 1840. It begins when the four angels are loosed. Ends with the identical dynamics of Justinian and the last Constantine, when the Pasha, Pasha of Turkey submits his empire into the hands of the four great powers. This situation was created by Turkey's loss of power combined with, and this is a point I, w I hope we see, this situation was brought about by Turkey becoming the, the poor man of the East after ruling the world or being of power in the world for um, a, a few hundred years. It's at the end of its strength. And the former uh, power of Islam, Arabic Islam, Egypt, Egypt is wanting to uh, take control of the territory, the power, the strength, take control of Turkey's empire. There's a struggle going on between those two, and we have a third power, the four powers of Europe interceding. What I'm really trying to emphasize for us here is that um, this situation that brings the second woe to a conclusion is a three-way struggle, a three-way struggle. You have the Europeans, you have Egypt, you have Turkey. Now, the seventh angel. Let me, let me jump over here. Um, this is, I, I, I didn't, I ran out of time. This should be much clearer, but it isn't. So we're just going to have to suffer through that, if you will. This is 1844 right here. And uh, there's many things that you can say happened in 1844. One of them is that the third angel's message arrives in history. It becomes present truth. This time period in here is what we're going to deal with. And this is, this is, uh, there's, there may be a better word to express this, but this here I'm calling a mirror. And the reason that I'm calling it a mirror is we're going to show certain events that took place that lead up to 1844 uh, that I believe are reflected um, at the end of the world in a reverse order, in a reverse order. But the mirror time period, the mirror time period, the, the time period of what I'm calling the mirror, because I'm trying to emphasize reflection, begins when the third angel's message becomes present truth on October 22, 1844. And it concludes um, when the third angel's message becomes present truth again. Now, Sister White, we've read it more than once here. Sister White says that the third angel's message continues to be present truth, but at the Sunday law, uh, it becomes a different type of present truth because then uh, the fourth angel joins the third. It is actually here in history. It takes a, another step up in its idea of present truth present truth. So in this time period that I'm calling the mirror right here, there are several things prophetically 
that we understand that take place. They're all, they're all connected, but they're, they're identified in different ways. This is the time of the investigative judgment, and I'm not denying that the judgment continues all the way over here to when Michael stands up, but this is the time period of the investigative judgment. This is the time of the sounding of the seventh angel. Revelation 10, 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he hath de declared unto his servants the prophets. And if you remember, um, in one of Russell's presentations, he dealt with Revelation chapter 11 to identify... Um, the seventh angel, and some of, some of them, he didn't address all the points in the sounding of the seventh angel, but in Revelation 11, verse 15, which is the sounding of this seventh angel here in verse 7 of chapter 10, in Revelation 11, verse 15, it says, and the seventh angel sounded. So you have to bring verse 15 back here into Revelation 10. Um, and then he um, dropped down to verse 18, dealing with the um, sounding of this seventh angel, and he also dropped down to verse 19. He started with verse 19, which is where I'll start, just to remind us, refresh us of what he was saying. Um, this is what the pioneers taught too. This is pioneer teaching, verse 19. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hell. And the pioneers correctly understand that when the seventh angel begins to sound is the time period when you could see into the temple of God and see the Ark of His Testament. It was October 22, 1844, when the most holy place was opened and Christ went in. That door was opened and the door was shut to the holy place. The pioneers identify the beginning of the sounding of the seventh angel. And what is the seventh angel? It's the third woe, woe, woe. The third woe is October 22, 1844. 44, when, and this passage in Revelation 11 gives you some, gives us some further information about the seventh woe. But then Russell went up to verse 18, and he said in verse 18, in the time period of the third woe, the seventh trumpet, it said, and the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come, and the time of the dead that they should be judged. And then if you remember, we had a little discussion about this, at least some of the groups after he shared this. He, he quoted a passage out of early writings, I believe. Is it in early writings? Where Sister White says, dealing with verse 18, that the, nations, the anger of the nations and the wrath of God and the time to judge the dead are three different distinct items that come in their order. You remember that quote? So because of that, we know uh, very simply, if we're familiar at all with basic prophetic history, that the time of God's wrath is when? Seven last plagues. There's, there's, there's the time period of God's wrath, seven last plagues. So the nations that are angry comes before the seven last plagues. And the time to judge the dead in this passage is talking about the judgment um, that takes place at the end of the thousand years. And therefore, the pioneers, using this identical logic, which Sister White confirms in early writings, say that the third woe goes all the way to the destruction of the wicked at the end of the thousand year millennium. That's the pioneer logic that we've dealt with. So that's, that's something about the, that's the history of the sounding of the seventh angel. But, back to, back to your board here, but in the days of the voice of the sounding of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So not only the mystery of God, but the mystery of God that he has declared to his servants, the prophets, in the plural. And we know what the mystery of God is. It's right below there, Colossians 1, 26 and 27. Even the mystery which hath been hid from ages and from generations, but now is made manifest to his saints. How is it made manifest to his saints? Through the prophets, because it has been declared to the servants, the prophets, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, hope of glory. In the time period of the sounding of the seventh angel, and brothers and sisters, let me walk over here to the board. The sounding of the seventh angel on October 22nd, 1844 begins, and uh, it goes till the end of the millennium. But it's at this point that the mystery of God um, is completed 
because this is where the investigative judgment takes place. This is where Christ finishes the work of salvation. This, this is the mystery of God that takes place during this sounding that has been revealed to all the servants of the prophets. And the, the punchline of this, when you look at the servants of prophets, is that at the end of the world, during this time period, God is going to raise up and perfect a group of people that fully reflect, uh, reflect his character to stand in the crisis time period of the seven last plagues or the third woe or however you want to portray it. That's, that's part of what takes place in the sounding of the seventh angel that the prophets all spoke about. Isaiah 33, 24. And, and I'm taking little passages from the prophets to confirm that when Revelation 10:7 says, as he hath declared to his servants the prophets, the prophets were all telling this story. They were telling a story that they're, at the end of the world, there's going to come a point when God is going to fully forgive his people and raise a purified people up to demonstrate his character before the entire world. Isaiah 33, 24, And the inhabitant shall not say, I am sick. The people that dwell therein shall be forgiven their iniquity. Amen. Isaiah 44, 22 and 23, I have blotted out as a thick cloud. Now in our prophecy school, when does the blotting out take place? It's progressive, it's progressive. When my name comes up in the judgment, the final judgment of my name, if I'm found worthy, he blots my sins out. And you know what? My character remains that way forever. I, have, I will receive the, the refreshing of the presence of the Lord and be in the latter rain experience and proclaim the loud cry message. That's what the blotting out is all about. It doesn't take place at the very movement in the sanctuary. It's progressive. It, be, it begins in the time period which Sister White says, no man knoweth the day or hour that it begins, but it begins in the time period that we know as the judgment of the living. I've blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgressions and as a cloud thy sins. Return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Why do you think Isaiah is saying sing and shout? Because these are terms that have to do with the louder, louder rain, loud cry time period. The 144,000 have a song. It's the loud cry time period. They shout aloud, cry out. Sing, O ye heavens, for the Lord hath done it. Shout, ye lower parts of the earth. Break forth into singing, ye mountains, O forest, and every tree therein. For the Lord hath redeemed Jacob and glorified himself in Israel. And that's what we tell people uh, that the final warning message is, isn't it, from Christ Object Lessons? The last warning message for a dying world is uh, the message of the character of Christ, which his character is his glory but he does it in his people. Zechariah 3, 8 and 9. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellows that sit before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua, upon one stone shall be seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave the graving thereof, saith the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of that land in one day. What day is that? called the Day of Atonement. In the Day of Atonement, he's going to remove his iniquity from his people. Here's a quote on that passage from Prophets and Kings. Zechariah 3, 8 quoted, in, in the branch the delivered to come lay the hope of Israel. It was by faith in the coming Savior that Joshua and his people had received pardon. Through faith in Christ they have been restored to God's favor. By virtue of his merits, if they walked in his ways and kept his statutes, they would be men wondered at, honored as the chosen of heaven among the nations of the earth. Now is reached the complete fulfillment of the words of the angel. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, thou and thy fellow servants that set before thee, for they are men wondered at. For behold, I will bring forth my servant the branch. Christ is revealed as the redeemer and deliverer of his people. Now indeed are the, the, are the remnant men wondered at, as the tears and humiliation of their pilgrimage give place to joy and honor in the presence of God and the Lamb. In that day shall the branch of the Lord be beautiful and glorious, and the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and comely for them that are escaped of Israel. And it shall come to pass that he that is left in Zion 
And he that remaineth in Jerusalem shall be called holy, even everyone that is written among the living in Jerusalem. And of course you can contrast this with what we've looked at in Revelation 13 and Revelation 17. The rest of the people in the, in the world, they're not written in that book. Joel, I, and if, you, if you're catching what I'm saying, we're going through and we're looking what the servant, the prophets say about uh, the mystery that is completed during the sounding of the seven, seventh trumpet. Joel, this is another testimony. So shall you know that I am the Lord your God dwelling in Zion, my holy mountain. Then shall Jerusalem be holy and there shall no strangers pass through her anymore. Notice the distinction. It's holy. No more strangers. For I will cleanse their blood. What's blood symbolic of? Sin. Sin. Life. Sin. For I will cleanse their blood that I have not cleansed, for the Lord dwelleth in Zion. Jeremiah 50, 19 and 20. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. Amen. And the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. Amen. This is from Great Controversy 425. And this is one we're all familiar with, but it's worth reading because all the prophets um, give testimony to this, including Ellen White. Says the prophet Malachi 3, 2 and 3 quoted, Those who are living on the earth when the intercession of Christ shall cease in the sanctuary above are to stand in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. Their robes must be spotless. Their characters must be purified from sin by the blood of sprinkling. Through the grace of God and their own diligent effort, they must be conquerors in the battle with evil. While the investigative judgment, or while the seventh trumpet is sounding, while in the investigative judgment is going forward in heaven, while the sins of penitent believers are being removed from the sanctuary, there is to be a special work of purification, of putting away of sin among God's people upon earth. This work is more clearly presented in the messages of Revelation 14, when this work shall have been accomplished, the followers of Christ will be ready for his appearing. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and is as in former years. Then the church, which our Lord as his coming is to receive to himself, will be a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. Then she will look forth as the morning, fair as the moon, clear as the sun, and terrible as an army with banners. Let's look at the word thunder now. We are, we're looking at Revelation 10, even though we haven't really been in there except for verse 7, but I want to put a, a couple more platforms down. Luther was one day devoutly climbing up these steps, Pilate's staircase, when suddenly a voice like thunder seemed to say to him, the just shall be, live by faith. Thunder can be a voice. The voice of God is heard from heaven declaring the day and hour of Jesus' coming and, the delivering, and delivering the everlasting covenant to his people. Like peals of loudest thunder, his words roll through the earth. Thunder can be a voice. Evangelism 194, quoting a, quoting a passage from the scripture that we're all familiar with about a trumpet. There are many who do not understand the prophecies relating to these days, and they must be enlightened. It is the duty of both watchmen and laymen to give the trumpet a certain sound. Be in earnest. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. Now, and show a voice back here is a thunder. A voice here is a trumpet. This is the point I'm trying to make. Voice, trumpet, thunder, interchangeable symbols. Cry aloud. Spare not. Lift up thy voice like a trumpet. <laughs> and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. The hearts of men around him were filled with every evil, with strife, envy, malice, and wickedness. They would not be impressed by a message of mercy and love. They were represented by John as a generation of vipers, and to them he gave scathing rebukes because of their self-righteousness. His voice rang out as a trumpet. Thunder, voice, trumpet, interchangeable symbols must be determined by context. The voice of the trumpet of the three angels. Notice in Revelation 8.3 that the trumpet of the three angels that go, 
of the woe, woe, woe. I'll read it. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. The seven trumpets can be understood to be seven voices or seven thunders if they're in the right context. What I'm dwelling on is not right here, the, the, the text, but the symbols um, that are identified in Scripture. Now, a trumpet is also a warning, and we've already read one passage that qualifies that, but we'll read another. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 126. Let the church arise and repent of her backslidings before God. Let the watchman awake and give the trumpet a certain sound. It is a definite warning that we have to proclaim. God commands his servants, cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. The attention of the people must be gained. Unless this can be done, all effort is useless. And in one of the conversations we've been having here uh, this week, week from time to time is, you know, the purpose of the, this warning, fearful warning message of prophecy, and this is a good, good one to throw into that discussion, the attention of the people must be gained. Unless this can be done, all effort is useless. Though an angel from heaven should come down and speak to them, his word would do no more good than if he were speaking to the cold ear of death. But a, a trumpet is a warning, is a voice, is a thunder. When God sends to men warnings so important, now here's a warning that's a little bit different. When God sends to men warnings so important that they are represented as proclaimed by holy angels flying in the midst of heaven, he requires every person endowed with reasoning powers to heed the message. Warnings can also represent angels, voices, thunders, And also represent God's people. I have had precious opportunities to obtain an experience. I have had an experience in the first, second, and third angels' messages. The angels are represented as flying in the midst of heaven, proclaiming to the world a message of warning and having a direct bearing upon the people living in the last days of this earth's history. No one hears the voice of these angels, for they are a symbol to represent the people of God who are working in harmony with the universe of heaven, men and women enlightened by the Spirit of God and sanctified through the truth, proclaim the three messages in their order. Notice how many different ways um, these symbols are interchangeable. The three angels' messages are voices, people, warnings, thunders, trumpets. You can, you can interchange those. 1888 materials, 926. Time is short. The first, second, third angels' messages are the messages to be given to the world we hear not literally the voice of the three angels, but these angels in Revelation represent a people who will be upon earth and give these messages. John saw another angel come down from heaven having great power and the whole earth was lightened with his glory. Revelation 19.1. It's got to be a typo. Um, that work is the voice of the people who, of God proclaiming a message of warning to the world. Notice the interchangeable terms, trumpets, thunders, voice, people, angels, warnings. We're now going to look at the prophetic mirror. We've built some platforms to try to work through this. I wished I would have got out here a little bit earlier and made this a little bit clearer. But what we're suggesting here at this point is that there is a series of historical events that walk down to the third angel's message on October 22nd, 1844, and these histories are figurative delineation of events. They're figurative, and that when we get to the point where the third angel's message becomes present truth for a second time, we will see that these histories are reflected on this side of the mirror only, the reason I call it a mirror, it's in reverse order, okay? It reverses out. And this is where I have great potential to lose the whole audience. This is the part where the thinking caps, if you can, should come on. Um, the first event that we'll point you to, but, but really, this is a real simple one to see. This part is simple. This, this part is simple. We have more to put down here at another presentation. That's where it really gets hard, but this is pretty simple to see. 
The first one, the year 1755, forgive my terrible writing up there. You can write down to that, next to that if you're taking notes, Revelation 6, 12, and beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as a sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. When was this fulfilled in history? Revelation 6, 12, in the year 1755. Sister White deals with it here in Great Controversy 304. And this is the earthquake, the Lisbon, Portugal earthquake, 1755. And the historical event that um, seems to fit on this timeline that follows that is the French Revolution in 1793. And you will find that dealt with in Revelation 11:11. 11, 11. And after three, and a half, three days and a half, the spirit of life from God entered into them and they stood upon their feet and great fear fell upon them which saw them. Uh, there's a bigger passage in there to identify the French Revolution. But that's the French Revolution time period. And you'll see Great Controversy 287 the year 1793. Notice the date, 1755, 1793. We're going forward in history with these events. Next event that we're putting on this timeline leading down to the end of the world is the deadly wound of the papacy. Um, and please note, if you haven't noted it before, but we have said it here, so you've no doubt noted it. Daniel 11, verse 40, is the verse in the Bible where you can historically identify the deadly wound of the papacy. We talk much about it, but it's verse 40 of Daniel 11 that marks the point in history when the deadly wound is revealed. And as Seventh-day Adventists, we should understand that, even though we don't. This is the verse. If you're going to teach people about the papacy and its deadly wound, you should understand Daniel 11, verse 40. And in the Great Controversy 266, it says the 1260 years of papal supremacy began in A.D. 538 and would therefore terminate in 1798. At that time, a French army entered Rome and made the Pope a prisoner, and he died in exile. So 1798, the deadly wound. The history is still moving forward. Revelation 14, 6, the first angel's message. And I, I've, been, uh, I've been referring to this quote. I, I think we have another one as we move forward, but we've talked about it. But this is the quote I've been pointing forward to, if you remember. Um, the prophecy of the first angel's message brought to view in Revelation 14 found its fulfillment in the Advent movement of 1840 and 44. That isn't the quote. I've been referring to two quotes that we have that identify 1842 as the second angel's message. This one, though, 1840, the first angel's message. Um, this is when the mighty manifestation of the power of God was carried to every mission station in the world, as Russell has been dealing with this week. <clears throat> this is the quote, one of the quotes I was pointing forward to. The second angel's message, June 1842. In June 1842, Mr. Miller gave his second course of lectures in the Casco or Costco Street Church in Portland. The different denominations, with a very few exceptions, closed the door of the churches against Miller. It's 1842 in June. And that's the second angel's message arriving in history. Now, I purposely, even though it's all pretty cluttered, I purposely throw this line in here to, to identify that the midnight cry joins the second angel's message. That's what that means in my mind. And that's what we'll look at next. The midnight cry, Matthew 25, 6. The autumn of 1844. Of all the great religious movements since the days of the apostles, none have been more free from human imperfection and wiles of Satan than that of the autumn of 1844. At the call, the bridegroom cometh. Go you out to meet him. The waiting ones arose and trimmed their lamps. They studied the word of God with intensity of interest before unknown. What'd they do? They studied the word of God with intensity of interest before unknown. I was talking to a brother today, and we were talking about if this message that we've been teaching here this week was correct, if it was correct, then one of the things we can say about it is that we're paralleling the pioneer time period. And one of the arguments that we've made here this week 
is that Daniel 11, 40 to 45 gives the identical dynamics necessary to duplicate the midnight cry. Because what brought the midnight cry to the Millerites was new light based upon the message they had been proclaiming. And when that new light was fulfilled in prophecy, the door closed on the virgins. The message they had been proclaiming was Daniel 8, 14. The new light that brought the midnight cry was the starting point for the 2300 days that allowed them to calculate October 22nd, 1844, and on October 22nd, 1844, the door closed. And we're suggesting that the new light at the end of the world is the fact that Daniel 11, verse 41, is identifying a Sunday law in the United States. That's new light, new prophetic light, directly connected to our message, which is the third angel's message. And when that arrives in history, when the Sunday law arrives in the United States, the door once again closes on the virgins. It's the identical dynamics. Therefore, if we're seeing that light, and it really is the light, then we're at this time period, and the parable says, at this time, the wise virgins need to start trimming their lamps, which means studying the Word of God. We need to be studying like never before. This is where she deals with the midnight cry, early writings 277. Angels were sent to aid the mighty angel from heaven, and I heard voices which seemed to sound everywhere. Come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins, that you receive not of her plagues, for her sins have reached unto heaven, and God had remembered her iniquities. This message, what message? the fourth angel's message. This message seemed to be in addition to the third message. She's here describing how the fourth angel's message joins the third. I was looking for the last part of the sentence. This message, the fourth angel's message, seemed to be in addition to the third angel's message, joining it as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message in 1844. The midnight cry up here, it joins the second angel's message. It's, it's not, it was, there wasn't four messages. It wasn't the first, second, and the midnight cry was the third, and the great disappointment was the fourth. The midnight cry is part of the second angel's message. It joins it. The third message arrives, October 22nd, 1844. I just have 1844 up there, but we all understand. October 22nd, 1844, I hope. During the early days of the Advent movement, the first and second angels' messages were proclaimed with power in Portland, Maine. And after the disappointment, when light shone upon the sanctuary question and the three messages of Revelation 14, and the third angels' message was preached faithfully in that place and throughout the East. I've had people argue before that when I'm suggesting that the third angels' message arrives on October 22nd, 1844, that it was long after that before the pioneers really came to a correct understanding of what took place when the door was opened in the most holy place. And that's true. But the reality of it is, is that on October 22nd, 1844, the door was opened to the most holy place, and the potential to understand was there from that point in terms of marking it in history. At that point, October 22nd, 1844, Daniel 8, 14, the door closed on the foolish virgins. And this quote we've looked at more than once. We'll put it in the record, plus there's a handful of people here that haven't been here all week. I am often referred to the parable of the ten virgins, five of whom were wise and five foolish. This parable has been and will be fulfilled to the very letter, for it has special application to this time, and like the third angel's message, has been fulfilled and will continue to be present truth. To the close of time. So, what we're saying here is that we have the, the earthquake, the French Revolution, the deadly wound, the first angel's message, second angel's message, midnight cry, third angel's message, at which point the third angel's message, the door closes on the foolish virgins, the third angel's message becomes present truth. The third angel's message will continue to be present truth until the close of time. What I'm suggesting to you is that these events here, when the Sunday law arrives and the third angel's message reaches its second aspect of present truth, that these events are going to 
be sim they're symbolized back here, and they're going to unfold in that direction in reverse order. So, when does the third angel's message uh, arrive in history again as present truth? Daniel 11.41 The papacy shall also conquer the glorious land at the Sunday law, and many people will be overthrown and receive the mark of the beast. But some will escape out of Babylon as symbolized by Edom, Moab, and Ammon at that time that the latter rain is poured out and the loud cry message is given. The door closes um, for the foolish virgins once again on, on this nether quote, companion quote, when the United States speaks as a dragon. So this here, the door closes on the virgins. Why do I say on the virgins? Um, I'll make that distinction in one moment. Door closes on virgins both here and here. At that time, at the Sunday Law in the United States, we've already read one quote. Uh, this message seemed to be in addition to the third message joining as the midnight cry joined the second angel's message. At this time, the loud cry joins this message just as the midnight cry had joined this message. So these are connected. The next thing is Daniel 12, 1. Michael stands up. Now why am I saying, what's the connection between Michael stands up and, uh, and what would be the next thing back in history? And that's what I'm suggesting, that this history is going to come backwards in this history. In 1842, what happened in 1842? The organized churches closed their doors. See, the organized churches closed their door first at the beginning, and then the door closed on Adventism. The organized churches closed their door of probation in 1842, and the door of probation was closed on the virgins on October 22, 1844, but it reverses back. Here at the Sunday Law, the door closes on the virgins of Adventism, but it's over here where the door closes on the world, everything else, everyone else. It reverses out backwards. So when Michael stands up, this can be understood as being represented as the organized churches closing the door of their probation in 1842. The seven last plagues. Now, now I don't argue, okay, I, I don't argue. If you want to criticize, I don't think there is a legitimate criticism here. But these events here, are very close together, where these encompass a couple hundred years or so, well, a hundred years, roughly. But that isn't necessarily any kind of test for prophecy. So we're acknowledging that these events are very close together, but uh, nevertheless, they're waymarks. And we're suggesting that the seven last plagues, which begins right here when Michael stands up, uh, Michael stands up, and then he um, puts on his garments of vengeance, pours out the seven last plagues, uh, that whole process, that the seven last plagues is th the beginning of this. What's the first angel's message announcing? The time of God's investigative judgment has arrived. Well, the seven last plagues is not the time of God's investigative judgment. It's the time of God's executive judgment. This is where his executive judgment begins. Executive judgment, plagues, investigative judgment, uh, first angel's message. The fall of Babylon. In the midst of the plagues, the Euphrates dried up. Babylon falls fully and completely. And we go back here to 1798, and we see the papacy receiving the deadly wound, and certainly the papal power receiving its deadly wound is a type of Babylon falling. They line up perfectly. Next event. Armageddon. Armageddon, this um, last stand against God here at the end of the world, symbolized by the French Revolution and the chaos that took place in the French Revolution. And we've looked at uh, a couple quotes. Here's another one, The Great Controversy 584. 
Would we know the result of making void the law of, law of God? The experiment has been tried. Terrible were the scenes enacted in France when atheism became the controlling power. It was then demonstrated to the world that to throw off the restraints which God has imposed is to accept the rule of the cruelest of tyrants. When the standard of righteousness is set aside, the way is open for the prince of evil to establish his power in earth. And the French Revolution is pointed to by inspiration is illustrating this time period at the end of the world. And you'll notice that most of those are on that side are dealing with what goes on in the plague time period. This is one we've read earlier. The worldwide dissemination is the same teachings that led to the French Revolution. All are tending to involve the world in a struggle similar to that which convulsed France. The bloodbath that we know is Armageddon. And then where do the plagues um, come to their conclusion? And the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air and there came a great voice out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were voices and thunders and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth, so mighty an earthquake and so great. This earthquake of the seventh plague comes over to here. It's easy to see, isn't it? It's easy to see. It fits like a glove. And, uh, I mean, it's simple, but, but, that's, we're just establishing this platform. Where we're going with this, and, and Lord willing, in uh, the lunch break, I'll clean this up for the next presentation. Here's where we're going with this. This is what I want you to understand before we try to prove it to you. Um, is this. We're suggesting, I'm suggesting, that this time period that I'm calling the mirror, the sounding of the seventh angel, which is also understood as the time period of the investigative judgment, acknowledging that the judgment continues till Michael stands up, but during this time period here, that began in 1844, in that time period here, there are different illustrations in scripture that we can bring to this, such as the investigative judgment. That's, that's a symbol of this time period. The sounding of the seventh angel is a symbol of that, this time period. But what we're going to attempt to show you is that what, what brought us, what brings us to 1844, what we're dealing with at this point, what Brother Dickey was, I assume, dealing with, I missed that presentation, but what Russell's been touching on a little bit is one of the things that brings us to October 22nd, 1844 is the conclusion of what? The second woe. I mean, there, there may be a little bit of um, discussion still going on about here or here. I believe it comes to a conclusion here, but, but my point is this. We have a history here where right here, the second woe, comes to its conclusion, and I would suggest to you that before the second woe was the first woe, and this was the sixth trumpet, and this was the fifth trumpet, and before this fifth trumpet, we had the fourth trumpet, the third trumpet, the second trumpet, and the first trumpet. You follow my logic? Okay. I'm saying that the trumpets, they start way before here, but they come to this history, October 22nd, 1844, and that the characteristics, when you take the first four trumpets as a block by itself, as scripture sets them apart, first four trumpets are four trumpets, last three trumpets are three woes. When you treat this as a block unto itself, and you treat the first woe, the fifth trumpet, as a block, as it unto itself, and the sixth trumpet, the second woe, as a block unto itself, that because of this, not because of, but you find that just as this, that when the third woe begins to be fulfilled, that the characteristics of the first six trumpets are repeated. I, 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 I want to be careful about the word repeated. I do not believe 
in some types of repeating of prophecy, so I want to be careful. But they're repeated in a reverse order, which means the characteristics of the second woe come first. The characteristics of the first woe come after that. This would be the sixth trumpet, the fifth trumpet, and the first four trumpets, their characteristics come third. Okay, that's what I'm suggesting. We're not taking that up now. But I'm going to give you an overview. We've, if you've been in the prophecy school, you, you noted it, but maybe not thought it was that important. But twice we have set forth the characteristics, we did it today, of the first and second woe. Um, Arabic Islam, Turkish Islam. And we did that on purpose because we knew we were heading to here. And those characteristics were taken right out of the, the pioneer understanding. I mean, you can go back in, you can test me by the pioneers. I'm not adding any strange twist to pioneer understanding. And what I'm saying is, when we take these prophetic characteristics in three blocks, first four trumpets, first woe, second woe, that here at the end of the world, these characteristics are repeated in a reverse fashion. And when we look at the characteristics, they possess the characteristics of Daniel 11, verses 40 to 45, which is bringing the books of Daniel and Revelation together in connection with the trumpets. And when the angel of Revelation 10 came down out of heaven, what he did in a very simplified fashion is he brought the message of Daniel and Revelation together, and it was the message of the trumpets and the books of Daniel. And that's where we're heading and Lord willing, we'll take this up this afternoon. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for this Sabbath. Um, we trust that you are providentially leading in our, in our interaction this day. We ask for you to Continue to bless us um, in a mighty way. Open our minds, our hearts. Uh, give us discernment. Give us a willingness to um, take these things we're hearing and test them with your word. Um, let this week of um, study um, change us into effective tools in your hands. Um, we have people that have already departed. We ask for traveling mercy for them. Take them wherever they're going safely. Um, and Lord, we... We thank you now as we break up for lunch that you have been with us throughout this week and encourage you to, to continue to keep our hearts and mind lifted up to you throughout the rest of this Sabbath day that we can um, keep this Sabbath holy and honorable in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen.